Let me start by taking you back to March 31st, 1981, and Ronald Reagan is newly elected President of the United States. The security back then was very different than it is today. And back then, I went to school in Washington, D.C., and it was really, there would be a, a, one of those wooden horses, and the President would walk out, and people would just respectfully stand behind the, hor behind the horses. If somebody started to move, the police would just sort of block them a little bit, and it was a very civil kind of arrangement. In contrast, today, you go up to the White, you can't even get within 300 yards of the White House. When I was there, you could walk into the Capitol, just like a congressman. You could park in the front, right in front of the Capitol. So back then, Reagan was giving a speech at the Capitol Hilton Hotel to the Teamsters Union. He was newly elected, so he really wanted to create a great impression with the country and the people. And so after it was over, he walked out, and as was expected, he walked right out the front door. And there were a bunch of people standing there, people walking up, who's here, who's here? They said, oh, the president's coming out. So he walked out, and as he began to walk towards his limousine, Reagan had this habit, if he liked what you said, he would turn and he would answer your question. And if he didn't like what you said, he, would, he had hearing aids, he would be like, huh, huh? And so, as he began to walk to the limousine, Mike McCarthy, the Secret Service agent, was with him. Somebody shouted a question, and he liked it. So he turned to answer, and as he did, pop, 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 pop. Everybody froze, except for the Secret Service. In an instant, they knew what had happened. Somebody tried to assassinate the President of the United States. Everybody all of a sudden collected themselves. Mike McCarthy grabbed Reagan by the back of the jacket and threw him into the limousine. The limousine back then were different than they are today. The seats faced each other. They had a wheel well inside. Reagan landed on the wheel well. McCarthy dove right on top of him. 250 pounds. The door slammed shut and the limousine screeched off. As, it, as the protocol was at that time, get him to the White House if there's not any serious injury. So McCarthy got off Reagan, sat back. Reagan sat back and they looked at each other. And Reagan began to breathe very laboriously, but they did not see any kind of particular injury. So up to the White House, they, they sped. Then Reagan coughed. And when he coughed, he coughed up blood. And the protocol changed. Get him to the closest hospital, Fog, Foggy Bottom Hospital, George Washington Hospital in Foggy Bottom. Limousine screeched across town. You can imagine putting the whole world on alert. I remember personally, I was in the, the allergist office with my mother and the nurse. I stuck her head and said, somebody tried to shoot the president. And we said, is he dead? They said, we don't know. The limousine pulled up to the hospital. All the doctors, the nurses, everybody was standing there waiting for Reagan. The door opened up. McCarthy jumped out went to grab Reagan, and Reagan pushed him away. Inside the limousine, he buttoned his jacket. He stepped out, and he stood there for a moment. He looked at him, he looked at everybody, very calmly. Not a word was said, but the message was loud and clear. I am well, we are safe, things are fine. Remain calm. Then he walked through the doors, the door shut, down he went. In an instant, Reagan sent a message to the world without a word spoken understood the power of the personal brand. So today I want to share three things with you. What is a personal brand? Second, why is it absolutely indispensable that each of us consider it? And third, what are a few things you can think about so when you walk out of here, you're a little bit better than when you walked in? See, here's what you need to think about. Everybody has a personal brand. Everybody. It's either positive, negative, or neutral. So why is a brand important today? There's three reasons why your brand is absolutely important. The first thing is this, we sell something, me and you, that's invisible. The days of the product are kind of long gone, right? We sell services. Problem is 80% of all buyers are visual. They need to see something. 79.4% of the U.S. economy is driven by services, not by toasters, not by refrigerators, not by cars. It's by something that's invisible. But if the buyer's visual, and they need something visual, and there's no product, what is it that they're buying? You. Because see, he, here's the scoop, right? Nobody's going to like, like, oh, I love your negotiation skills. They're awesome. You just don't, it doesn't work that way. It's invisible. People can't see it. They can't touch it. And people need to. They need to validate their decision. So what they're buying is they're buying you. And that's why your honesty and your integrity is so critical. It's so, so critical. And you can wipe out all of the brand equity you build over time with one or two simple dumb mistakes. But the more brand equity you have, the more opportunity you have to rebound from those errors. The second reason why your brand is critically important today is because there's so much noise in the marketplace. It's absolutely incredible how loud it is. Right? The brand is so loud in the marketplace. What do we do? What do we have to block out the noise? What do we have to block out the noise? We have Paul Wade. 
We have receptions. All right? What else? All right? We have email blockers. Everything we can. The average person will get 3,000 emails a day. The average person, excuse me, a week. 3,000 emails a week. The winners are the people who are the synthesizers, people who can put the message together succinctly. You want to think about what branding is? Think about taking the simple and doing really awesome stuff with it. There's only three primary colors, but look what Michelangelo did with them. There's only seven notes, but yet we listen to Beethoven hundreds of years later. There's only ten numbers, but look at what Einstein did. The world is free because of what he could do with those ten numbers. It's the simple, good, complex, bad when it comes to your brand. Your ability, your ability, take those simple, over and over and over again. You know, people ask me uh, frequently, what you know, what's the thing that's unique in, in, in high performers? I mean, like they'll say, like, because I have the opportunity to work with many people like you who are high performers, who are entrepreneurs, who are in their own business. And I will tell you, it's not the talent. The talent is what is assumed. It's the ability to execute obsessively over and over and over and over. The third thing that's important, why your brain is important today, your mind is important, is because we live in a commodity world. That's what we do. We live in a commodity world. We sell something that's a commodity. You know, Mike, Mike I would say, you're right, you get away from the fee sharing, focus on the uniqueness. The problem with that, Mike, is it's too hard for a lot of people. Like presentations, when I work with, sometimes real estate people make presentations, right? I say, look, here's what you should do. You should go in for the first five minutes, and you should talk about your credentials, right? Two or three minutes. Look, the assumption is I wouldn't be here unless I was talented. You wouldn't invite me into the room. But I want to just tell you a little bit about my credentials. Second, I got to talk about the market, even though I know you already know about the market, especially if I'm number three or four in line in the presentations. But I want to talk about the market in case you think, holy man, I didn't know anything about the market. I never talked about it. But I want to spend the next 50 minutes talking about what makes us different. But that's too hard for a lot of people. But I will tell you, if you ruminate over that, and you struggle over that, and it takes months or years, once you get it, it's like a sickle cutting right through butter. Right through butter. But instead, people get stuck on the fee sharing. People get stuck on, you know, well, you, here's my cell phone. You can call me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I know your spouse really must love that. But, you know, that's the differentiator. You can call me at home. I mean, you, you laugh, but there are people that that's their differentiator. I know when I work with law firms, right, it happens every time. I work with a law firm, and I haven't worked with Lake and so I can say this because it's not, it's not them, but I went to a law firm, big law firm, what makes you guys unique? We've got really smart lawyers here. Super, super, super smart lawyers. And I think to myself, that's interesting because Paul Hastings, they put ads in the paper and they go, hey, all the dumb lawyers, come over here. <laughs> <laughs> we got a law firm of dummies. It's awesome. You should be here with us. The assumption is you've got really talented lawyers. They're really, really smart. Yes, I know if I say, do you guys think you're better than Christian Wakefield? Yes, you do. And if I was in Christian Wakefield, they'd say they're better than you. And if I'd say you're better than Collier, Collier says they're better than you. I get it. Studly, back and forth. And the answer is some of you are better than some of the people over there. And some of the people over there are better than some of you in this room. But if that's what you're going to rely upon, you're not going to go very far. So guys, bottom line is everybody has a brand. Positive, negative, neutral. Everything we do either adds to or takes away from it. Number two. Three reasons why you you got to focus on your brand. Number one is the buyer's visual. We sell something that's invisible. Number three, number number two, is we live in a commodity world. We're selling exactly what our competitors are selling, right? And number three is there's a lot of noise in the marketplace, and we need to be able to break through that noise. So, I want to close with with uh, one with one story, um, and uh, it's really I always I got started in the California prison system. I was not a prisoner, right? <laughs> but, I, but I got started in the California prison system because um, I wanted to be in this business and I couldn't get anybody to hire me. So I was involved with a program called VIP, which is Volunteers on Parole, which matches lawyers up with prisoners. So I went to them. I figured they're not going to say no, right? So I always make the joke that I got started in the prison system and I had to pay to let me do my seminars. So uh, I went there and uh, I did the, the men's units and the women's units. and. In that prison, you get a Y number or an M number. And a Y number is youth authority, which means that if you were convicted of your crime before you're 15 years old in California, and they believe you have some redeeming quality, that they will parole you by the age of 25. 
you automatically will get a second chance. If you are, if you get an M number, it's the big house. You're going to San Quentin or whatever it is, Pelican Bay, and that's the end. Now, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll house M number young kids there until they become of the age of 21 or there's space at Pelican Bay and then they send them off there. So the people that I dealt with were murderers and gangbangers and all of the you know armed robbery and burglary and drug dealing and, and all of it. And it was interesting because you walk in, right, and you think they're going to look different, but they don't. Yes, they're not dressed like we're dressed, but, but they're people, you know, and they're just like you and you have to keep reminding yourself, you know, that you're inside a prison setting. And before you get started, they make you sign this form that if they take you as a hostage, they don't have to negotiate for you, right? It's exciting, right? But what happens is you get in there and then they begin to know who you are and you know, you're know you walking through the whole facility and you just gotta keep paying attention and keep reminding yourself. So the men's, women's, the units were great, you know, and I enjoyed it very much, but the girls were, were, were really special. It was really a nice experience because so many of them were caught up in the crimes of their boyfriend or their husbands, right? And they weren't hardened. They just were at the wrong place at the wrong time. So we used to do this exercise where we would, um, I would buy roses for all of the participants in the seminar. And there'd be, you know, 30, 40 people. And what I would do is I would give each one of them a rose. And, you know, these people, A, never got flowers from anybody or had been there so long they haven't had flowers in a long, long time. And I would say to them, go off in the distance and smell what, uh, and s smell it, and listen to what it says to you because it'll speak to you. There's a purity to the rose. Just listen, right? So these people would go off, and you'd see some would laugh, and some would cry, and some would just heart, right? And uh, then we would come back to the group and we'd kind of debrief a little bit. And I remember there was this little girl there, and she, I only knew she was a girl, quite frankly, because we were in the girls' unit. She, she was just hard, 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 hard. But I looked down, she had this little Mickey Mouse watch on. And I knew, what a fraud. In a good way, what a fraud, you know? I mean, that was who she really was in her heart, but that was the way she protected herself. So we'd get together, and, um, and we'd come back, and I'd say, okay, now let's breathe out all of the negative energy. So breathe out all the negative energy. And then I would go around, and I would say, so what did the, what did the rose say to you? And one girl said, you know, it reminds me of picnics with my mom. And I said, oh, that's, that's nice. And then what does it remind you of? And she says, oh, you know, it uh, reminds me of high school. And, you know, I, I'm not going to get my uh, GED because I want to go back to the prom. And I'm going to get out soon and I'm going to go back to the prom. And I want to get a corsage, you know. And, uh, and I said to some other girl, I said, so what's it remind you of? And she just looked at me and she said, you know, it reminds me of funerals. But I'd like to go to a wedding someday. And you can imagine how startling that was. But I also realized in that moment that I had a special opportunity, a special gift. I got somebody to touch somebody in a very unique way. And I got them to think they could be better than they ever thought they could possibly be. And I will tell you that at the end of the day, if you have a great brand, the dollars and cents will come. But the real impact of a great brand is that you affect people like unlike other people can because the greatest of all human accomplishments is the liberation of your fellow man's spirit. So I would say to you is, is build a great brand, make a lot of money, and have a great impact on the people in your company, people outside your family, in your community at large. Because then your life will be fulfilled. And you'll have fulfilled your purpose. So with that, I appreciate your time. Open that expectations. <laughs>